In this part, we will discuss pathologies of the peristone short axis view seen with B-mode imaging and color Doppler. If you didn't see so far the normal anatomical findings of the peristone short axis, and if you want to repeat, you can always click the box and go back to the other videos. Starting with an M-mode evaluation of the aortic valve, we can use the M-mode to create the so-called aortic box. What is the aortic box? What is the M-mode? The M-mode is this line over time. So we only see this area we are scanning and here we have the aortic valve, the aorta in the center. This is the left atrium, this is the right ventricle. And if you look closely, here we do see the aortic valve. We do see here it is closed and here it opens and that's the so-called aortic box. You do see some fibrillation, so to call, in or with the aortic valve, which is absolutely normal, but this is how it opens and then it closes again. So this is systole and then it's diastole. So the aortic box is something you can use to see if the aortic valve is properly opening. The aortic box in a normal view with less good image quality seen over here, you still can differentiate that there is the box. You do see here it's closed. So here are several boxes with a normal opening of the aortic valve. And in this example, you do see a pathological finding. The opening in the first place is definitely reduced, so it doesn't open as good as the example on the left side, but it's also closing relatively quickly. So that's a premature closure of the aortic valve. And you do see that in the B-mode image as well, that points towards a reduced left ventricular function. You see this over time happening basically all the time. So the opening is reduced and the closure of the aortic valve is premature. Here you do not see that the leaflets are thickened. So this is not the aortic stenosis. You can see this in the B-mode image as well. So do not mix it up. We will take a look at aortic stenosis with M-mode soon. In this case, we have amyloid heart disease. You did see the patient priorly with the tricuspid regurgitation in the prior videos. And you have now the aortic valve in the center of the image and you do see that the cusps are thickened. So we have here the right coronary cusp, the left coronary cusp and the non-coronary cusp. The leaflets are thickened and when we add color Doppler, we can see that there is aortic regurgitation present. It's a small regurgitation, it's a central AR, but still it is present and with the help of color Doppler we can localize and to a certain degree already quantify. So if it would fill up the entire LVOT, it would be more likely severe. In this case though, it's a rather small flare seen in the middle at the center of the aortic valve. Moving on to tricuspid regurgitation, we can have the focused view on the tricuspid valve again. So this is the tricuspid valve and here we do see a more moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation. Keep in mind, this is still not the optimal view. We do not see the origin. So probably it is severe, but we need another view to actually quantify TR. I want you to focus in this patient on another finding. So we go back to the view focused on the aortic valve. This is the tricuspid valve, the pulmonic valve, the RVOT. We do see that the atria are dilated, but focus here on the left atrial appendage. So that's the left atrium, that's the left atrial appendage, and it is rather prominent. So in this case, if there would be a large thrombus present, you could even see it in a parasternal approach. Keep in mind that still for excluding a thrombus, you need a TE study, of course, but you get the idea that with a prominent left atrial appendage, you can also perform measurements and a visual assessment if there is a thrombus present and seen already in a transthoracic approach. And already you can see if a thrombus is present from TTE. More to focus on the left atrial appendage. So it, this is a specifically focused view where you can see bigger parts of the left atrial appendage and you can use color Doppler where you see that blood flow is until the end where we can visualize. So in this case, there's probably no large thrombus present in the left atrial appendage. 
Simply keep that in mind if the left atrial appendage pops up, that you think about it and that you already can quantify it to a certain extent. Now focusing on the pulmonary artery, in this case we do not have optimal image quality, but we do see that this is the pulmonic valve, that's the pulmonic trunk, the right and the left pulmonic artery, where we do see here parts of the aorta. So this already is the ascending aorta. And with this specific view, we can perform certain measurements. We can, for example, measure the pulmonic trunk and the RVOT over here. In this case, it is definitely dilated. And we can use a pulsed wave Doppler to quantify the pulmonary acceleration time. So this time frame you can measure here. And if it is below 60 milliseconds, it's definitely pathological and pointing towards elevated pulmonic pressures. And in this case, yes, the size does matter. If you have an enlarged pulmonic trunk, do not forget to mention it in your report. Moving on to the mitral valve, we repeat, we have the anterolateral and posterior medial commissure. So that's posterior medial commissure, that's the anterolateral commissure, and we can see all the segments of the mitral valve. And in this case, we do see something is wrong over here. So this is a mitral clip. You have an echogenic structure in the area of A2 and P2. So this is most likely a mitral clip. You see that the opening of the mitral valve is reduced, but as you can see in the next loop, also MR is definitely not severe anymore. You see a rest of mitral regurgitation over here, but this patient was clipped because of a severe mitral regurgitation. Furthermore, when you perform a mitral clip procedure, of course, you have to pass the interatrial septum. And you do see that here is a small iatrogenic ASD, so an atrial septal defect. You can scan that in a peristernal short axis or in a peristernal short axis from a subcoastal approach, which we will discuss in the lectures of the subcoastal views. Here I have an M mode placed again with color M mode. So this is the small iatrogenic atrial septal defect. Furthermore, when we have a mitral clip and the problem of the mitral valve, you can evaluate it in the peristernal short axis, but also in the peristernal long axis view, where you do see the reduced opening of the mitral valve in this focused view. Furthermore, in this view, we do see a normal contraction of the inferior and lateral parts of the ventricle, but look at the septal parts. This is hypoechoic, it's thin, that's a scar. So this is a patient with coronary artery disease after a myocardial infarction where you see scarred tissue where there is no thickening and no function present. In this example, we have a peristernal view of the mitral valve again. We have the anterior and the posterior mitral valve leaflet. And in the B mode image, we already see that there is a problem with the P2 segment of the mitral valve. So in these views, you also can differentiate if there is a prolapse of the mitral valve or even a flail leaflet present. We can see with the color Doppler information that there's probably eccentric mitral regurgitation, which is definitely not trivial. So in this case, we have to see the mitral valve from several views to actually quantify mitral regurgitation. But we already know from the peristernal approach that there is a structural problem of the mitral valve already seen. Moving on to the papillary muscles, this is a loop we have seen in the prior videos, where we see a thickened myocardium and thickened papillary muscles. So for LVH, this view can also be used to measure the extent of the interventricular septum and the posterior lateral wall. Furthermore, we do see the right ventricle, the tricuspid valve, and here even parts of the liver. Always keep in mind that this hyperechogenic line is the pericardium. So pericardial effusion, if it surrounds the left ventricle, can very nicely be seen in this view as well. Here's an example of a non-compaction cardiomyopathy, a very rare cardiomyopathy. This is the level of the mitral valve where you already see that the left ventricle is probably enlarged and that there is reduced function present. If we move the transducer, tilt the transducer to the level of the papillary muscles, we see the same. The ventricle is relatively thin 
and function is definitely reduced. But if we move towards the apex, we do see or we start seeing hypertrabeculation. So in this case, you can measure the trabeculated area, so the non-compacted myocardium versus the compacted myocardium to visualize if there is truly non-compaction cardiomyopathy present. And you also can differentiate if there are four or more prominent trabecular present, which would be another hint towards the diagnosis of non-compaction cardiomyopathy. If you want to see a case of NCCMP, click the box in the video. One more important tip I can give you is that if you want to really truly see the most apical regions, so the supraapical cap, you have to tilt the transducer even more downwards to see in this case of non-compaction cardiomyopathy even more trabeculations and larger areas of non-compacted versus compacted myocardium here as well, mostly in the inferior, inferior lateral and lateral region of the left ventricle. If that's the case, you simply move one intercostal space downwards, so more quarterly, and then tilt the transducer up and down, and very often you get even a better glimpse of the supraapical cap. Furthermore, you can use color Doppler. You have to reduce the PRF to approximately 30 centimeters per second, and then you can even visualize the trabeculations and the blood flow in the trabeculations way better. And this again points towards non-compaction cardiomyopathy. Optimally, in this case, you use contrast imaging, but contrast will be the topic of another lecture. Now, this already concludes the first part of pathological findings in the peristernal short axis view. We did discuss the opening of the aortic valve. We did discuss non-compaction cardiomyopathy and left ventricular function. We have seen regurgitations, mitral regurgitation, aortic regurgitation. In the next videos, we will focus even more on mode measurements and on aortic stenosis by means of scanning it in the peristernal short axis view. And we will continue with pulsed wave and continuous wave measurements.